a great pleasure pleasure to be here. Um, I want to, to underline the point that I'm I'm speaking as a reformed minister. Um, so this is very much um, so I'm I'm neither I'm neither Roman Catholic or Jewish. So I'm speaking very much as an outsider's perspective on these matters. And just to say, the the book that was launched yesterday, I I, I just looked at it and I see that uh, David Neuhaus has a has a chapter on Israel in there, which I haven't read, of course. Um, Nostritate is uh, rightly credited as the turning point in Catholic-Jewish relations in the 20th century. With this document, uh, the Second Vatican Council turned its back on theologies of replacement and the teaching of contempt, which had been characteristic of popular European Christian narrative about the Jews. Instead, it adopted an entirely different approach, which affirmed the Jews' continuing place in divine election. What Nostretate did not address was issues of land within Jewish self-understanding, thus avoiding the geopolitical issues that relate to the Jewish people's return to history, to use a significant phrase in Zionist thought. The purpose was to address specifically the post-Shoah reality, whereby Christianity needed to address the church's apparent complicity through centuries of anti-Judaic discourse in the Shoah. But in recent years, the place of land has become a persistent issue within the broader Christian Jewish encounter. And this is because Israel is central to how most Jews understand their place in the world today. Yet any understanding of land must also need to take into account a modern nation state, namely Israel, and this creates its own challenges and dangers. So in this paper I'm looking to explore how land is emerging as a critical issue in Jewish Catholic relations through the work of the Israeli Jesuit Father David Neuhaus, but I'm also throwing in some comparative comment from time to time from Bishop Kenneth Cragg, the Anglican theologian who died in 2012, known particularly for his work on Islam and Arabic, and who lived in the Middle East for many years. Father David Neuhaus is one of the leading voices within the Israeli Catholic community, and, is, and as such uniquely placed to offer perspectives on Jewish Catholic relations in particular, as well as the wider issues relating to Jewish Christian relations. He was born in South Africa to Jewish parents, travelled to Israel in 1977 when he was 15, and was to find faith through his encounter with Orthodox and Catholic Christians. But also had a deep engagement, has a deep engagement with Islam, both in terms of a study of Arabic and through personal relationships with Palestinian families. Now, al although David avoids the word convert to describe his journey, the fact that this secular Israeli Jew not only became a Christian, but went on to become a Jesuit priest and theologian, makes him both uniquely placed on the one hand and controversial on the other. His uniqueness lies in the fact that he is the only halakhically Jewish Israeli Jesuit who has a deep engagement with both Israelis and Palestinians and controversial in that converts always throw up significant sensitivities in interreligious dialogue. He himself points out the sensitivity of this and that sense of vulnerability that many Jews feel towards those that become Christian as he relates his, his account of, his, of the initial reaction of his own family to this change in his life, and he refers to this in, in his writings. However, it should be said from the outset that he does not demonstrate any hostility towards Judaism. On the contrary, he manifests a deep respect for the Jewish tradition, to which he is connected by virtue of blood as well as faith tradition. One might say that Neuhaus is a living example of what Nostratati set out in written form. Now in this paper I'm, I'm just I'm drawing out four particular areas from David Neuhaus's work 
in relation to Jewish-Christian relations. The first is Jewish identity and the Catholic Church. Secondly, salvation of the Jews. Thirdly, the writing of history together. And finally, attitudes to the State of Israel and matters of justice for the Palestinians. So, firstly, Jewish identity and the Catholic Church. From the outset, David Neuhaus underlines the need to engage with Jews and Judaism according to Jew current Jewish self-understanding and not allowing the, the a Jewishness of our imagining to replace the Jew of reality in the modern world. And this is why land is so critical to dialogue with Jews, because Israel has become central to their identity. This echoes the words of Kenneth Cragg, who notes that for most Jews, Israel is how they find their place in the world. There is, however, a disjunction between how Jews see themselves and how Christians understand Jews. Christians seek dialogue with Jews through the lens of faith and belief, whereas Jews on the whole seek to engage with the world as a people and as a nation. Now in making this crucial point, we are led to the recognition that the Jew of the past was very different to the Jew with whom the church engages in a post-Shoah context. The Jew of the past was a figure of contempt, blamed for the death of Christ, becoming conflated with the myth of the wandering Jew. However, the Jew of today is primarily a member of a people who seek to apprehend their place in the contemporary world. Crucially, this involves not only a theological response to anti-Semitism and the Shoah, but also a need to take seriously how Zionism relates to contemporary Jewish self-understanding. And of course, issues of land then become unavoidable. So now we move to the question of the salvation of the Jews. Now the teaching of contempt carried with it the presumption that the Jew was condemned unless they repented and were baptised. The myth of the wandering Jew, of the Jew banished to wander in eternity, um, held, held huge power, particularly in the Middle Ages. However, in light of Vatican II, this matter required re-examination. Should the church proclaim the gospel to the Jews or should Judaism be understood as a parallel means towards salvation? Now this question appears in different places within Neuhaus's work and of course is a question that um, um, is, is um, pervasive throughout 20th century at work on Jewish Christian relations. An important issue is in, in this regard is that of shared scripture. He, um, David Neuhaus quotes uh, Walter Ca Walter Cardinal Walter Casper, who emphasises that the Jews do not need to become Christians in order to be saved, but rather to continue in faithfulness to God's commands. And of course, Cardinal Casper also speaks elsewhere of the Jews as a sacrament of otherness. However, it is Neuhaus's article on the events of 2009, we'll come on to 2009 a little bit later, where these questions are placed within the wider geopolitical context. The fundamental question that is posed is whether during the papacy of Benedict XVI, there was a rowing back from the Second Vatican Council to a conservative retrenchment. In relation to the specific issue of the Jewish people and salvation, this becomes a live issue when these developments are read in the light of the declaration of Pope John Paul II that the covenant with the Jews is not revoked. This was widely understood by Jews and many Catholics at the time as meaning there was no requirement to convert to Christianity in order to attain salvation. The Jewish scholar David Novak, for instance, in his recent book on Zionism, states that this means that Christians should believe that the Jewish covenant is not replaced, 
but merely supplemented by Christianity, which implies that Christianity is the covenant for the Gentiles. However, during the Benedict papacy, the theological implications of this came to be teased out when the bishops' conferences in Germany and the United States clarified the teaching on the Jews and salvation. The Central Committee of German Catholics in 2009 followed the similar US and United States uh, Jewish Catholic document of 2002, which argued that missions to the Jews were an abrogation of the Jewish covenant. The German bishops, however, took the view that this was tantamount to, deni to a denial of the universality of the gospel. Similarly, the Catholic bishops in the United States did not rule out evangelization of the Jewish people, but argued that it would take an utterly unique form, precisely because God has already established a particular relationship with the Jewish people. David Neuhaus notes both the nuancing and clarifying nature of this. Furthermore, Jewish understandings of divine revelation are always incomplete. So whilst God does not change his mind with regard to the Jewish covenant, the church also believes that the fulfilment of the covenant is only found in Jesus Christ. However, dialogue must never be used as a means of proselytism, and whilst this assertion is welcomed by Jews, Neuhaus notes the persistent tension within Jewish Christian relations, namely that Catholics come into dialogue with a conviction that Jew and Gentile alike are saved by Christ. This point bears interesting comparison with that of Bishop Kenneth Cragg, who takes issue with his fellow Anglican James Park, whose seminal work on Jewish-Christian relations stresses the, the dual covenant. Craig suggests that Parks, and those that have subsequently followed his line of argument, have in effect rewritten the New Testament and the creeds to suggest that Christ's salvific acts are directed only towards Gentiles and not the Jews. Craig maintains that's a complete rewriting of the New Testament. Meanwhile, Christianity, says Cragg, is born out of an abandonment of the religious exceptionalism that Judaism represents. But not to become a more open form of Judaism, but a new community, the church, which incorporates Jewish understandings of covenant. In his discussion of Kenneth Cragg's approach to Judaism, the Baptist theologian Nicholas Wood characterises Cragg's position as one of a theology of fulfilment rather than replacement. Now this observation might lead us to ask whether the clarifications of the implications of Nostra Aetate, as we have just been discussing, suggest a move from theologies of replacement towards theologies of fulfilment rather than dual covenant. For David Neuhaus, an important question is whether these developments in the German and United States and um, bishops' conferences uh, reflect a conservative re retrenchment during the Benedict papacy. However, he prefers the view that this is merely the outworking of the theological implications of Nostra Aetate and what it means to assert that the covenant with the Jews is not revoked. <coughs> this point echoes that of Gavin de Costa, that the Second Vatican Council did not rule out mission to the Jews, but implicitly endorsed it whilst ruling out coercion and the targeting of one faith over another. Furthermore, de Costa argues that the claims made that the Vatican Council endorsed the view that Judaism is a means of salvation, that Judaism is a valid given covenant, and that mission to the Jews is illegitimate are tendentious as they do not appear in the documents of the council. Documents, however, do uh, doctrines do, however, develop, and this is reflected in the way in which David Neuhaus treats the developments regarding salvation of the Jews during the Benedict papacy. 
There is, it must be noted, a political as well as theological significance to this matter due to the extent that Judaism is now so much defined through Zionist fulfilment in the land. But this understanding of Jewish salvation through Zionist intentionality has never quite shaken off the charge that it was a negation of the divine, a salvation wrought by human hand. Nevertheless, the creation of the State of Israel in 1948 and its military successes, particularly in 1967, were viewed by many Jews as evidence of the saving hand of God. The stepping back into history that Zionism represented was a departure from the quietest tone of Judaism hitherto. Rabbi David Hartman, an influential figure in late 20th century religious, religious Zionist thought, makes this observation. Israel's return to history as a political community constitutes a proclamation to the world that Judaism and the Jewish people cannot be reduced to a spiritual abstraction. When Judaism manifests itself as the way of life of a particular historical people, as it can do in Israel today, it is a permanent obstacle to any theological view that perceives Judaism as the superseded forerunner of the universal, universalist conceptions of Christian and Islamic monotheism. <coughs> the image of the European Jew poring over the Torah and the Talmud, awaiting the future messianic age, is one reacted against and rejected by Zionist thought. Thus, messianic longing becomes actualized in political liberation and statehood. And this represents a pronounced theological challenge to how Christianity understands and relates to Judaism, but also in terms of the theological language concerning salvation, Israel, Zion, and also matters of eschatology, given the implicit abrogation of eschatology that many schools of Zionist thought represent. It's worth observing that this is where Zionism owes a debt to the philosopher Nietzsche, who emphasised the will to power and the importance of myth in culture and civilization, And that more than echoes the early Zionist spirit, a movement that sought to free Jews from assimilation and anti-Semitism in Europe and to transform a compliant and emasculated people into one that struggled against history, political power, even the land itself, and especially the indigenous people of the region in order to gain an ethnic masculinity. Nietzsche's appeal to early Zionism contained an inherent logic. Nietzsche came to believe that post-Enlightenment Europe had outgrown all that Christianity had taught and represented. Zionists, too, were reacting against a Christian Europe that held them in chains for too long. It is Zionism's blend of religion and nationalism and its absorption of the religious into political that represents one of the most significant, though probably often avoided, issues for Jewish-Christian dialogue. To put this point differently, we might say that the teaching of contempt has had a theological and a political price to pay. These questions and challenges set the context for Jewish-Christian encounter in contemporary times, framed as they are by a post-Shoah context and the realisation of messianic longing in the form of Zionism as realised political ideology. So now we come to the next uh, part of this paper, which concerns the question as to whether Catholics and Jews can write history together. David Neuhaus believes that the ability to speak of history together rather than in competing or negating narratives is central to the search for reconciliation. This is true for Palestinians and Israelis. It is also true for Jews and Catholics. For Jews, how history is told is important to matters of identity, especially as they relate to the land. The experience of Jews and land is a crucial issue for much of Zionist thought. 
Prior to the establishment of the State of Israel, Jews were a landless people, often viewed as aliens in the context in which they were found. Leon Pinsker, one of the founding fathers of Zionism, observed, To the living, the modern Jew is dead. To the native-born, he is a stranger. To the long-settled, a vagabond. To the wealthy, a beggar. To the poor, a millionaire and exploiter. To the citizen, a man without a country. To all classes, a hated competitor." End of quote. The State of Israel, and thus Jewish return to landedness, is critical to Jewish self-understanding. Likewise, matters relating to the Jewish experience during the Shoah and the role of the church are also of direct relevance to Jewish encounters in the contemporary world. The contested legacy of Pope Pius XII leads Neuhaus to ask whether it could ever be possible for Jews and Christians to write history together. While the history of Jews and Christians in Europe has been, in Neuhaus's words, submerged in a valley of tears, the story of the church constitutes sacred history for Catholics, he says. Here, this sacred history collides with alternative versions of Pope Pius as lacking in courage, even com lacking in compassion, to act against the Shoah. Now, whilst noting the tendency among Pius's defenders to engage in hagiography, he points out that the frequent critics of the, of the, of the then pontiff also lack critical reflection. The very existence of the Shoah is a resounding accusation against the Pope, the Church and the world. However, it should be possible and desirable to document what the Pope did at the time to, and to write and own this history together as Jews and Catholics. And this is a vital task on the path to reconciliation, friendship and trust. Ed Kessler likewise stresses the importance of Jews and Christians, remembering that in Nazi-occupied countries, churches were often targeted, and that during the Second World War, the future Pope John XXIII provide, provided baptismal certificates for Hungarian Jews in a bid to protect them from Nazi persecution. This would echo Neuhaus's desire for the writing of a common history. And it remains a critical issue that has resonances with other aspects of Jewish Christian engagement. But an important question is whether such mutual historical writing would still be sacred history. Kenneth Cragg has also spoken of the problem associated with sacralization of nationhood. And this poses the question as to whether history, as told within a religious or theological framework, seems destined to take on the vest vestment of the sacred. This is as true of Judaism's telling the story of the Shoah and the foundation of the State of Israel, as well as the story of the Catholic Church in history. Here we are left with interesting questions to ponder. In particular, how does sacred history, that is the theological understanding of the place of the church within history, intersect and dialogue with political narratives of the land that have taken on the vestiges of the sacred, albeit with an overtly secular language? And a second question is whether, as history written together by Jews and Catholics, means that the writing of sacred history has had Jewish participation in the process of its writing. And so I now come to the State of Israel and issues of justice and the Palestinians. And in a sense, this carries on from the previous point, the defining question concerning Jewish-Christian dialogue, that of the understanding of the State of Israel, but also the failure thus far of Palestinian self-determination. It is because Israel is so central to the belief and understanding that Jews will inevitably come back to Christian perceptions of Israel. So David Neuhaus asks, does the state of Israel take on theological significance within the dialogue with the Jews? 
how does the modern state of Israel relate, if at all, to the Bible? Concomitantly, what should the position of the church be in the conflict between Israel and the Palestinians, particularly as Catholics are caught up within that conflict? But a consistent complaint from Jewish dialogue partners is that the Catholic Church has been reticent in recognising Israel as integral to Jewish identity. David Neuhaus identifies four reasons why this has been the case. The first is a wariness of theologising the political, which brings with it some of the dangers associated with fundamentalist movements such as Christian Zionism. The second concerns the ongoing conflict in the region, unresolved issues relating to refugees, Palestinian nationhood, Israeli occupation of the West Bank and Gaza, the building of settlements, land seizures, all of which have impacted negatively upon Palestinians. And of course, that includes Catholics as well as Eastern Orthodox and other Christian communities. Thirdly, there is the matter of reading Dif read different readings of the biblical land. Catholics and Jews read the Bible differently in relation to the land. Neuhaus makes the point that Israel is understood as having a wider meaning than merely Jews in the land, which is how it is understood in Judaism. In Catholic theology, Israel also means the church. And the biblical concept of land is a place of transformation through the resurrection, where the land that is called holy is not restricted to biblical lands, but rather comes to signify the face of an earth transformed by Jesus' victory over sin and death. Now this point is reflected in aspects of Palestinian theologies of land, in particular that of the Lutheran uh, scholar Munta Isaac who maintains that Christianity has universalised understandings of land with a call and expectation to seek justice in any land where Christian witness and mission is exercised. And finally, in this list of reasons why the Catholic Church is reticent to recognise the place of Israel in Jewish self-understanding is different understandings of Jewish vocation. This is where David Neuhaus expresses his anxiety with Zionism. He asserts that many Catholics are ill at ease with the notion of Jewish return to the land, and that since Vatican II, the Church has fought against anti-Semitism so that Jews might find their home in, their, in the security among the nations of the world and fulfil their historic vocation. He concludes this point with the distinction drawn by Pope uh, Benedict on different, differentiating between the church's relationship to the Jews, which is concerned with spirituality and, and religious matters, and attitudes towards the state of Israel, which are political, as offering a coherent distinction within dialogue, noting in conclusion that Catholics cannot ignore concerns of justice. The visit of ben Pope Benedict to the Holy Land in 2009 was a significant milestone in Jewish-Catholic relations. During that visit, the Pope visited the Western Wall, and Ed Kessler echoes the perception of many Jews that this contributed to a final repudiation of a theology of perpetual wandering. Meanwhile, the Pope also spoke during his visit of the basic link between the Church and Israel. But he did so whilst in Jordan, a predominantly Muslim country, not an insignificant detail. Pope Benedict, in doing this, laid down a challenge to much Arab Christian discourse that seeks to deny the connection of Judaism to the land, which prefers to lay emphasis, alternatively, upon a close Christian-Muslim symbiosis. This Christian-Muslim emphasis in Palestinian writing is fundamental. Father Rafiq Khoury, a Latin Catholic priest, suggests that relations with Muslims is a particular vocation for Middle Eastern Christians. Yet he sees dangers in attempting to create a separate Christian identity in the region that is homogenous in character, but rather needs to develop a truly ecumenical identity, 
within a predominantly Muslim culture. However, this trend is most pronounced in the work of, of Lutheran theologian Mitri Raheb, who underlines the umbilical nature of Christianity's relationship to Islam by suggesting that the Quran is the, is the Bible enculturated into Arab culture. He suggests that Muhammad's experience in Medina echo those of St. Paul in his disagreement with, the, with Jews regarding the legacy of Abraham, whether it was for the Jews alone. All of this raises important questions, how Western Christian theology should engage with Palestinian Christian thought in all its diversity, and how engagement with Jews and Muslims is impacted. Echoing Pope Benedict, David Neuhaus has noted how anti-Judaism is a significant part of Middle Eastern discourse. And whilst it is often suggested, as Mitri Raheb does, that this is due to Arabic being the common factor, such a narrative is also found in non-Arabic speaking societies such as Turkey and Iran. And therefore, Neuhaus concludes that this anti-Judaic discourse is forged from Islam, not the language of Arabic. We might further note that in terms of classical Islam, Jews being the primary religious other, something that came to be significant theme in the work of influential Islamist thinkers of the mid-20th century, including and especially Saeed Qutb, who has already been mentioned. To speak of Jewish-Catholic relations, however, implies that there is merely a single discourse. David Neuhaus points out that there are at least two distinct paradigms with regard to Jewish-Catholic encounter. The first, the more familiar Western European narrative of Jewish minority state status within a powerful, often anti-Semitic culture. This is the narrative against which Nostra Aetate reacted and sought to speak a different language as to how the church speaks of the Jews and Judaism. Jews were the outsiders in the European story, blamed for killing Christ, often blamed for social calamity. In this paradigm, the Shoah is the main reference point for Jewish-Catholic relations, and the creation of the State of Israel, the means by which Jews return to history and claim their own destiny. However, a second narrative is that which arises out of the Middle Eastern Arab narrative, where the main reference point is the Nakba, literally meaning calamity, that ensued from the creation of Israel as a Jewish state. This has meant that for the first time, Christians, including Catholics, have lived as a minority under Jewish political power. This alone makes Israel-Palestine a unique context for Jewish-Catholic relations, what Neuhaus calls a reversal of power relations. Thus, the daily reality of Israeli occupation means that the nature of the dialogue is profoundly different from that in the European context. However, in this context, it is the primacy of Islam in Middle Eastern society that holds and forms the narrative. Yet, as Neuhaus and Jamal Kader observe in their 2009 article, Catholics of the region, both Latin and Eastern, seek to engage with Jews as they understand themselves within the context of the Holy Land, which is in marked contrast to Nostra Aetate, which avoids matters of land. The paradox, however, is that the creation of the State of Israel in 1948 also contributed to the depluralization of the Arab world, where once vibrant Jewish communities in countries such as Egypt, Morocco, Tunisia, Lebanon, Iraq and Yemen almost completely disappear as a result of the geopolitical changes that the creation of Israel set in train. The often neglected experience of Jewish Arabs, many of whom found themselves expelled from lands where they had existed for centuries, is another aspect of this depluralization. These communities had a long history of engagement with Eastern Christian communities, as well as with Islam. Arriving in Israel, they brought with them this experience of lost pluralism. David Neuhaus points out that the only country where there is a developing dialogue between Judaism and Eastern Christianity is in the State of Israel. However, and additionally, the experience of Arab Jews 
points to how Israel has radically reshaped religious and cultural identity and points to how religious self-understanding can reshape and define the geopolitical status quo. It is within this context that Catholic-Jewish dialogue is unfolding and may prove to be of critical significance. These two narratives of the Jewish-Christian encounter are powerfully illustrated by the perception of the Jew in the Europe, perception of the Jew in the European as compared to the Middle Eastern context. The European Christian sees the Jew primarily as the victim of a misreading of the Christian tradition. The Middle Eastern Catholic sees the Jew often as a soldier, a policeman or a settler. Furthermore, Christians of the region do not see themselves as sharing the same experience of anti-Semitism that is felt by European churches, existing in a, co a context of Jewish dominance. This mirrors the contrast, even conflict, between either the centrality of the Shoah or the centrality of the Nakba. Notwithstanding that juxtaposition, David Neuhaus notes the official documents of the Catholic Church afford preeminence to, the, to its relationship to Judaism, both in terms of the Jewishness of Jesus, the place and authority of the Old Testament, and what the New Testament says about the ongoing validity of the Jewish covenant. His juxtaposition of these two anti-Judaic trajectories, that the Jew belongs neither in Europe nor the Middle East, is revealing in terms of much Jewish and particularly Zionist comment, where these two anti-Judaic narratives are conflated and understood as having common roots. To return to Neuhaus's starting point regarding Jewish self-understanding in relation to Judaism, and critically seeing the sense of belonging to the land are central to this and why narratives old and new that reject Jewish legitimacy in the land are so problematic for Jews. Yet matters of justice need to take centre stage within the Jewish Catholic encounter. Otherwise, says David Neuhaus, the emphasis upon common heritage will fail to see the issues as they confront Palestinian Christians. Now this is most sharply demonstrated when it comes to the Old Testament as a clear example of shared heritage, with the risk that the biblical Israel will be confused with the modern state of Israel. It is for this reason that Palestinian Christian thought and religious practice has sometimes avoided use of the Old Testament. The former Latin patriarch Michel Sabah was one of the first writers to identify a problem that exists within Palestinian hermeneutics, where difficulties with particular texts could lead to a new Marcionism, that early Christian dualist belief that rejected the Old Testament and the God of Israel, which was denounced by Tertullian as, a, as heresy. Be that as it may, Palestinians are still left with significant challenges with regard to shared language of both biblical Israel and the modern Jewish state that bears its name. Kenneth Cragg underlines this point in a typically dramatic, in dr dramatic way, and I quote, How should we read now the ardent prophecies of the land and the return from exile? In particular, how should Arab Christians do so in the painful ambiguity of blessing the Lord God of Israel, when the Israel is that of Menachem Begin, Moshe Sharan, not the Israel of Zechariah the priest or of Luke the Christian in their Benedictus. End of quote. These hermeneutical challenges are relevant to the historical narrative because of the way in which, as Craig puts it, statehood is sacralized which cannot be undertaken unilaterally in the modern world. How key texts from the Hebrew scriptures are understood within Judaism and how Christian writers assume they are understood by Jews is critical both in terms of how scripture relates to history and whether it has religious or secular status within Judaism. David Hartman argues that for secular Zionists, 
who were the founding fathers and mothers of Israel, the biblical narrative offered an anthropological framework rather than a divine directive. Thus the language of Israel becomes impor an important issue to be addressed in Jewish-Christian relations precisely because of its, the its theopolitical ambiguity. Yet this is an issue that remains problematic within Jewish-Christian dialogue. David Neuhaus draws attention to an incident from the 2010 Synod for the Catholic Church in the Middle East, when the Greek Catholic Archbishop Selim Bustros raised concerns about the confusion between conflating the biblical and political language, which led to a very public demand by Rabbi David Rosen that the Archbishop's remarks be repudiated by the Curia. Now, Rosen's remarks, it could be argued, illustrate a point of view that many within Judaism who are engaged in Jewish-Christian dialogue fail to take account of Middle East Christian self-understanding and not even to acknowledge that there is an issue of concern here. What Rabbi Rosen's remarks illustrate is the extent to which the Christian reference point in dialogue are framed in a Western discourse and how the emphasis of Eastern Christianity are not even considered important enough for dialogical to be of dialogical significance. Mm. This acute sense of being excluded from the broader dialogue is an Im another important theme in, Christian in Palestinian Christian writings, most vividly expressed in the words of Pastor Mitri Racheb, who suggests that the recasting of Western Christian theology in a way that dispenses with replacement theology with regard to Judaism has in turn created a new replacement theology where the Palestinian people are replaced by Israel. A distinctive, if not unique, aspect of Neuhaus's writings concerning the changing nature of Christianity within Israel itself he has carefully charted the trends regarding Christian communities that came to Israel as a result of Eastern European migration, where people of Christian faith have a Jewish connection. So there are Hebrew-speaking, including Catholic congregations, Messianic movements, as well as those from further afield that have come as migrant workers or asylum seekers. He identifies two challenges here. The first is with the transmission of the faith in a majority Jewish and secular context, with a trend towards emigration elsewhere. The second challenge is an ecumenical one, for whilst amongst Palestinian Arab Christians there is a strong impulse to what Neuhaus calls an ecumenism of solidarity, there has been a resistance to acknowledging the fact of Christianity in Israel itself is becoming increasingly plural. There are here divergent ecumenical trends in relation to Judaism. The Palestinian ecumenism of solidarity has often problematized Judaism, seeing it as lacking historical rootedness in the land and thus see, sees greater need for closer familial relations with Islam. Meanwhile, many of the non-Arab Israeli Christians see greater integration and rec recognition within the state of Israel seeking a deeper understanding of Judaism, often wishing to emphasize the Jewishness of Jesus. Neuhaus's observation that ecumenism thrives where political or ideological interests converge, pro-Palestinian or pro-Israeli, also points to, what, to how inter-religious concerns impact at a deep level with emerging ecumenical identities. However, this ecumenical identity is one that finds its context in the land. Land, therefore, matters in respect of Christian identity and theology. And this, I would suggest, is, the, is a significant implication of David Neuhaus's work. So, in conclusion, I referred earlier to a 2009 article. In that article, David Neuhaus reflects upon events of that, of that year and how they map onto the developing journey of Jewish-Catholic relations. 2009 was a tumultuous year for Jewish-Catholic relations that began with Israeli military action in Gaza, controversies concerning the fraternity of Pope Pius X and the, William, and the Bishop Williamson affair, 
along with matters already discussed in this paper, further controversies around Pope Pius XII, matters relating to the mission amongst the Jews that arose from clarifications from German and United States bishops, Israeli-Vatican relations, and then ending with the visit of Pope Benedict to the Holy Land. David Neuhaus notes that the word crisis has its roots in the, in the Greek word meaning judgment, decision or discernment. Thus the events of 2009 came to be seen as moments of crisis and grace. Much of the necessity of crisis in Jewish Catholic relations is the need to work through the implications of Nostra Aetate and the documents of the Second Vatican Council, taking seriously the reality that the Jew of older Christian imagining is not the Jew of the 21st century. The land is central to this crisis. Israel means that Jews are able to speak for themselves, no longer in the words of Kenneth Cragg, haunted by the trauma of homelessness. Yet, as Neuhaus knows, shows moments of crisis in the unfolding story of the church's ancient relationship with Judaism also move this story forward into insights of grace, but one where the lived experience of Christians in the land is central and not peripheral. This is a strikingly similar chord to that of Kenneth Cragg. He also saw the uniqueness of the place of Christianity in the Holy Land. He noted that for Christianity, being an incarnational faith, events and places have a sacramental quality. The sacraments are instituted in a place with physical objects. Being born and existing in a place of sacramental institution gives a unique quality to Middle Eastern Christianity. And of course, sacrament is the means of grace. So I end with a quotation from Bishop Kenneth Cragg. Such is the way of sacraments, and sacred geography can be one of them. The physical bespeaking the spiritual at the rendezvous with history. To be resident, however, as natives are, is to be peculiar, peculiarly in a privilege of grace. The Palestinian Christian is born into the very precincts of faith. It will be the Christian answer from everywhere, local or distant, that we need the same tests of faith, namely justice, tragedy, vicarious experience, and the way through suffering and reconciliation. Thank you.